Hello, and welcome to the Dialogue webinar. What is thinking? And what does it mean to think in APL? I don't really have a great answer for that. But today, I want to take you through a bit of an exploration. Uh, where looking at a particular problem from a few different angles can hopefully help us to shed some light on that question. Really sorry about the noise. Hopefully, uh, it's bearable. This, today's webinar is actually a follow-up to a previous presentation. Uh, here's a link now, and if you're watching live on Dialogue.tv, then I think Adam's going to paste this link into the chat for your convenience. Um, and in that webinar, the previous one, I kind of gave some fairly broad strokes uh, discussion about you know what I'd read and what various people's thoughts are on what thinking in terms of problem solving is, what is thinking in APL. And then uh, later on in that webinar, I uh, started to focus in looking at some techniques, some sort of problem solving approaches that come from Bob Metzger's 1981 paper, which is the inspiration for these uh, for these webinars. So it's about techniques you can use uh, if you're not super familiar, or even if you are, it can be useful to think about these things um, to get you from a problem towards an array-oriented solution. So then uh, we looked at a couple of, you know, these quite small, specific th ways of thinking. Uh, one was value first, then shape. And the other was uh, shape first, you know, pre you know, making an array of a certain shape and then altering the values. Today, I'm mainly going to be focusing on what I'm calling data transformation. It, that really is what it is. It's just transforming arrays in some way um, from an input to an output, I guess. It'll become clearer in a second. Uh, and then we're also going to look at um, thinking about things in terms of loops a little bit. Um, so as I said, if you're watching on dialogue.tv, there's a chat there. Uh, Adam is in the chat ready to answer any little questions you have and anything um, and he'll pick out certain questions and comments and he can forward them to me here. Having said that, oh, there was one more thing, sorry, I wanted to mention with regards to um, the paper, which is the inspiration for this. And that is, it's worth being aware, or it's worth mentioning that this paper was published in 1981. And so it predates uh, general nested arrays. And what this means is a lot of papers from this time will focus on uh, Boolean array techniques and, um, you know, especially rectangular flat array techniques. And those were developed at the time out of necessity. However, the methods that were developed and the techniques for thinking about problems um, still benefit... Uh, you will still benefit from thinking about these things and using these techniques today uh, for a couple of reasons. 
One is it's a good avenue to sort of force yourself to think in array-oriented terms. And secondly, uh, Boolean data and flat, non-nested, rectangular arrays are handled very efficiently by APL systems. So it's still worth thinking in these terms, even though we have general arrays today. OK. So now let's introduce the problem and the sort of first uh, framework for thinking through the problem. So the problem we're focusing on today uh, is fairly simple. It's say we have some Boolean vector, which we will call our location vector. So the ones in this case are indicating the location, locations of L's in our text vector. But really, we care about the Boolean vector for this. We want to transform this location vector into an expansion vector. An expansion vector is another Boolean vector which can be used with the expand primitive to insert fill elements after specific locations in some other array. OK, so the essence that the problem is to get from this input location Boolean vector and recreate this expansion vector function uh, to return the expansion vector. And so the way I'm going to start with is basically just giving you uh, the derivation of an idiom to do this, which comes directly from Bob Metzger's paper. And in there, he describes this method as kind of um, your function is a black box that you can't see inside, but you know what some sample input array is, and you know what the corresponding output array should be. And so you're just trying to reconstruct the machine that gets you from the input to the output. He describes um, taking, you know, literally a pen and paper, pencil and paper, uh, starting by writing, either writing your input array at the top of the page and then working down the page, trying to think of one transformation step by step that you can do that will eventually lead you to the output array or alternatively, starting with your known output and working up the page, thinking transformation by transformation, how to get to the start. So that's the approach he takes. And that's the one I'm going to uh, explain first. So as I said, to do this, we're looking, we're going to start with the output array. So let's just put the input to the side to keep it in the back of our minds. And let's think about uh, some way we can just transform this data or, or play with it. And one thing that I notice is that ones and zeros come in these pairs. So let's try rewriting the, the array, just grouping the one zero pairs together and leaving the other ones alone. So we're going to rearrange this into a column and I'm going to move my zeros next to the ones. So they're paired up and let's just squeeze the whole thing so it looks a bit neater. Now we have uh, what's called a ragged array, meaning that it's not rectangular. And in modern APL, this might be a feasible way to think about it because we could build a nested array, but we're trying to keep in the rectangular and Boolean uh, regime. So how can we make this a rectangular Boolean array? Well, we could fill in the gaps with ones or zeros that will keep it Boolean. And we could put the ones on the, we could put the new values on the left or the right of the array and kind of square the whole thing up. So, so here's what I mean by that. We could fill this ragged array on the left hand side with ones, or we could have left those original ones where they were and filled on the right with ones. This happens to be essentially the same thing. We could uh, fill on the left with zeros or we could fill on the right with zeros. And these are just four ways fairly arbitrarily thought of, but obviously, sorry, it's a bit manufactured, but I'm, you know, I hope you get the idea um, of just turning that ragged array into rectangular. So this last one, I'm going to discard outright because 
we lose all the interesting information. So that's no good. These other three sort of have uh, a similarity, which I hope you agree is starting to, you know, uh, leap out. It's a bit interesting. Um, so we could explore any of these, but I'm going to focus on the third one because it consists of our input vector laminated with its inverse. So we've already got one of the steps right there, uh, going back to the input. So yeah, so now we know how to get to this intermediate step from the input. Let's go back and think about where we, where we came from. Um, we built this from the output array. It does contain the one, 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 zero, one, zero, one uh, from the output we want. And the only difference is that we kind of want to get rid of the zeros on the left hand column and then ravel the matrix into the vector. So I can write this down, say I think about it row by row. If a row is zero, one, then I want to remove the zero. And if a row is one zero, starts with a one, then I want to keep both. And it doesn't take you long learning APL, you know, to realize that you should try a, a compress. And it's quite straightforward to find the um, two element vectors to do each compression, right? So zero one compress zero one leaves the one, one one keeps both. And we know the primitives to do this. So this sort of pseudo APL expression says we want to take the left matrix and compress it by the right matrix. And we need to compress each row. And you think, well, maybe if you've been watching these recent webinars with all the modern stuff, maybe you think, oh, we could do rank one and do it by rows, but that won't work because you'll end up with fill elements. Um, so maybe you could enclose, but then we're not dealing with flat arrays anymore. And that's kind of the point. Well, of course we can ravel the arrays. That's really what we should do. Um, since we keep, keep the same row major order. And if we ravel them both and compress the first one using the second one because of the swap, then we get our result. So yeah, we've already worked out how to get from our input array. Uh, to this left matrix, laminate with the inverse, and we can achieve the right hand one. I hope you've spotted it by just laminating ones on the left. So we've worked out that step, but I think we can clean up this final step. Um, firstly, let's swap the arguments out, right? So we can get rid of that swap. Then just for this sort of demonstration, let's ravel each of those first. And then this is our solution. So we can basically plug in the APL at this point. So uh, it's laminating our input with ones and then ravel it and then use that to compress the input laminated with its inverse and then, and then raveled as well. And this is the kind of old style uh, flat solution derived, you know, using Metzger's derivation. Um, this is, I've, I've turned it into a DFUN, but this is basically what's presented in the paper. I was looking through AppleCart to find, try and find some examples of, uh, different problems to try and demonstrate some of these techniques. And as I was scrolling, I found a description that seemed to eerily closely match, uh, this particular problem. And it's this train. It turns out that it literally did come from this. So, so this idiom at the top, uh, is in many, uh, APL idiom list, idiom libraries, idiom lists. The second one is available in Apple cart. It's just been modernized a bit, but I hope you can see it's the exact same algorithm. So, you know, we turn our output into a one column matrix with table and then, uh, catenate the inverse and on the left hand side with table again, the input and catenate ones. And then we use the over operator in version 18, instead of individually, um, raveling the input arrays. And because forward slash can either be a function or an operator, 
we use right tacker top slash to force uh, the interpretation into a function compress. So that's just kind of there for your interest. Uh, at this point, I just want to say again, if you want me to slow down, if you have questions about particular things, or you want me to go back over things, then go ahead and say in the chat and Adam can let me know. But otherwise, that was the Bob Metzger derivation of this particular problem. While um, I was sort of going through this stuff with my colleagues, we were thinking about different things. We had different uh, ways of thinking about the problem, um, even while just sort of going through this. And I want to look at another one now. And it's a similar, it's the same principle to start with. Um, we're trying to, you know, go from the input to the output, uh, figuring out the steps in between. But this time, the thought process is more, can we think of a more direct mapping from input elements to output elements? Is there some way of going more directly like that from one to the next? And what, what we thought of was, well, if you look at the, pro the, the proportion of ones and zeros here, you can kind of see it from this example, zeros map to ones, and the ones all map to one zero pairs. Okay, so if I shuffle things around, you can sort of see it clearer in relation to the example. And the zero to one transformation is nice and easy. We have a primitive for that. Okay, great. The one zero transformation is actually a bit easier initially to think of it as inverting the ones since we were already thinking of inverting booleans and then prepend sorry inverting the ones to zeros and prepending those zeros with ones and then in order to make sure the structure fills out we need to use each so then you end up inserting these one zero pairs at those locations so now this is actually a nested array approach but it's derived from just this other way of thinking about the problem rather than playing with the array, trying to think more directly about the transformation. So then the expression becomes invert our input. Find We want to apply our inverse and prepend function, this one comma each, at the locations which were ones in the input, but since we inverted it, they become zeros. And so we can use at not uh, to sort of specify those locations. And then we just apply our function and we end up with this uh, nested vector version. You can see all the elements are correct. So we just need to use enlist to flatten the whole structure. So while um, at first glance, it, compared to the other one, maybe this kind of looks like an attempt at golfing. Um, that's not really the origin. It it has come from, and I think in a sense is is a bit more of a direct expression of this thought process, which I thought was quite interesting. Stepping back a moment, if we think about those transformations again, that's not the only way you you know could think about obtaining those results. You could also think uh, it was also pointed out that you can use take to achieve the desired result. So one is one take one and one zero is two take one. And then the solution is just a matter of uh, turning the Boolean into appropriate uh, arguments for take. And then a little bit of nested array foo with each and commute to make it succinct. This is just, you know, another way of, of getting the mapping done in APL. Okay, so now I'm about to go on to the last sort of approach that we thought of or thought to go through. And 
really, I guess, uh, the thing is, if you're completely stumped, you know, on a problem, um, for a small problem, I mean, and you're a fairly inexperienced APLer, but maybe you've done other programming, then you can think, um, or it might be a good idea to try building up a looping solution. And by doing the looping solution, either you manage to kind of factor out the bits you've done procedurally, if you're doing lots of the same thing, you manage to factor that out into a parallel uh, array-oriented version, or um, you end up just seeing something <laughs> in the pattern. So um, let's see if our bits are L equals hello, then let's loop through the bits and see what we see. Um, the logic here, I hope it's easy enough to read, is um, the same as the mapping we were just thinking of. So as you get to each bit, if it is a zero, we just invert it to a one. If it's a one, then it becomes a one zero pair. Okay, we, we invert the bit and then just prepend a one is what's happening in the code here. Funny thing is, if I output the bits one at a time, you can see in the session, a fairly familiar uh, ragged array appears. I thought that was kind of just kind of neat in the end. Um, so on the one hand, it's possible that you gained that kind of inspiration, maybe from it, maybe that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, you can decide for yourself. But building this looping array led to some other considerations. Looping is generally considered bad in APL um, for a couple of reasons. It's not considered, well, yeah, for a few, I guess. It's not considered very array oriented in and of itself. Um, one thing that's particularly bad in APL systems is having to interpret the code every time you loop around. There's a lot of overhead there. It ends up being very inefficient. The second thing uh, that, that I want to mention is we're sort of assigning this output array or um, what do you call it? Preparing this output array and then repeatedly appending to it, right? Every go around the loop, we're extending the array and that's fairly inefficient as well. But this led to the thought that if, uh, one of the general things you can do to speed up loopy solutions is to pre-allocate your output array, you know, pre-allocate your result, and then just uh, do modified assignment or something like this to modify the, modify the bits in place. So that made us think, well, how big is the output array? Is there a nice easy way to find out? Well, from our input to our output, and having thought about the loop as well and, and all the, the ways, we know that we're gonna insert, we're gonna add an extra zero for every one in the input. So that's just the sum of our Boolean vector. And we're gonna have in the output a one for every bit in our input. So the length of our output array is just the sum of the sum of the boolean or the ones in our input plus the length of the input, which is pretty neat. So now we can take our input and we can look at our pre-allocated array. I've filled it with ones. Uh, and then we can look at our example output. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've charged ahead. Um, this is slightly different to the uh, example we were just looking at, but that's only so I can have three input ones so you can see this pattern that I'm trying to show easier. So there are as many ones in the input as there are zeros in the output. So then we can ask, okay, what's the relationship between indices of ones in the input and the indices of zeros in the output? I mean, they're not far off. There's something arithmetic going on there. The difference looks pretty convenient as well. 
And even if you think about this in terms of the kind of looping uh, solution, if you think about it in those terms, it makes sense because as you go along, the zeros become ones. But every time you reach a one, you want to insert a zero at the index one above that. So you'll want to flip the one that's one above where there was a one. And then every time you do that, the indices of subsequent ones get shifted over, right? Well, the, shift, the, the subsequent ones get shifted over so that indices increase by one. So the first zero goes one above, the second one two above, the third one three above, and so on. So now we can build this up here in APL to calculate the indices that need to be flipped. Then we ask where are the ones in B and add that to the integers up to the sum of B. And then it's a fairly straightforward expression to generate our pre-allocated array. Then we calc then we compute those indices. And then, I mean, this is, this is all of this. And it's just a matter of performing the not function at our pre-calculated indices. So, um, you know, my reasoning for going through this, I mean, for this particular problem, I think most people and certainly most APLers, even fairly intermediate novice or intermediate ones wouldn't think to bother about going through a looping solution. And I'll admit the, the thing is a little bit, uh, convoluted and manufactured, but in having gone through the process of thinking about what the looping solution means, um, it's ended up through a kind of winding stream of consciousness leading to, um, this quite solution, which is quite different to the ones that we'd thought of before. So, Um, we've gone through a f quite a few different things here, uh, I guess three different approaches to the problem in terms of think, you know, thinking about the actual algorithm, uh, as well as a few other little specify, you know, specific little, uh, APL ish things, but something that always comes up, especially if you have multiple solutions to the same problem, is how do they compare? Um, so we've already compared the sort of thought process behind them. Oh, sorry, that's the result. It works. <laughs> okay. Um, but people also want to know about performance, generally. Um, for APLers, it's important to point out this is not your holy grail. This is not the most important thing. Really, it's about going from your problem to a solution, uh, both, you know, quickly, um, reliably, as in your solution is correct, uh, hopefully, you know, bug free. Um, and also in a way where your resulting expression or function, you know, your resulting APL solution expresses the problem solution in a way that uh, at least other APLers can understand or that you can reason about um, in a nice way. But everyone likes to, to compare speedy performance and stuff, so let's do it anyway. Um, first of all, let's look at all the defs together. Uh, I'm naming the functions like this, so Old is what I'm calling the old style version of the function from the Metzger derivation. Uh, new is the kind of modernized trainified version. It's a matter of taste, I guess. Then we have the uh, concatenative sort of thing um, where we're flipping the bits and prepending ones. Uh, I've got a replace version here. It's very similar. It's just that instead of doing um, catenate each, we're using the constant operator to derive a constant function. So this is a function that just returns one zero and applying that at those same locations. It's the similar thing. There's just a little APL subtlety thing there. Um, then there's the version 
that sort of came from similar logic, but involved using take. This one proved to be reasonably expensive because we're performing take on uh, every element, no matter what. Whereas at performs a function at specified elements, specified indices. Then we have the version where we uh, pre-allocate our output array and then compute, or calculate the indices of bits that need to be flipped. And then of course there's the looping one. Um, in fact, let's cover that now. So the looping one's bad. Uh, I think we expected this. The looping one's very slow. I'm not going to dwell on it. We know why. Okay, so let's look at the others a bit closer. Um, so we've got our very short uh, argument. And it looks like there's a fair amount of contrast. Um, the Metzger one's pretty reliable. We expected this. Flat, rectangular, Boolean algorithms uh, are always going to give you decent performance. The nested ones, as expected, are worse. Uh, the calculated one, I think, maybe it's the, all the computation in the middle. Maybe it's the use of at, which I think in the general cases. I'm not, I'm not going to reason too hard about that. I mean... The thing on top really is, uh, or the thing to remember is, honestly, no matter which one you choose, this is all happening in uh, for a small array. It's all in microseconds, so it's not even that bad uh, what you're losing there. The difference between old and new is just some weird stuff about uh, the way defense are interpreted versus uh, the way that derived functions and trains are fixed. Um, in practice, that's a really negligible difference. It's not worth really thinking about. Okay, so that was a very small input argument. Let's look at a really big input argument. So this is a, a million element Boolean vector. We start to see some real differences. The take version, um, because it's doing a take, which is fairly heavy operation on every single element, ends up suffering a big penalty. Um, we see there's some weird quirk of, I think it's to do with uh, constant being optimized. Um, and then... The sort of shocker, I guess, if you compare to the previous one, but if you reason about it, it makes kind of sense. The calculated one ends up being the best. And this comes down to something that I think uh, I talked about in the Fast APL webinar, and I've talked about it in uh, previous webinars, a really early one about um, competition problem solutions. And this is the idea that uh, really at the core of it, if you can make your algorithm so that it has as few computations as possible, then that's what's going to be the best, um, really, regardless of implementation details. If you can just cut down the number of computations you have to do, then that's going to be the best performance. Again, a problem like this, you should be happy with any of these solutions, really. Um, maybe the first ones, maybe even the nested ones are easier to reason about in principle, Takes a bit more thought, I think, for the calculating one, maybe. I mean, the whole problem's not that complicated, I don't think, so that's kind of why I chose to pursue it so much. I was also pleasantly surprised at just how much variation um, came out of this, really. It's quite interesting. But yeah, so, you know, even in this, what we can assume is maybe one of the worst cases... Well, I guess it's the worst case if they're all ones. Um, you know, if you have to flip half the bits, then you're doing pretty well. If you had a really sparse input array, then you're going to get even better gains. So that's, uh, I'll let you know, that's it for considering this problem and the um, these kind of techniques, these heuristics 
for today, the data transformation and even thinking in terms of loops. I mean, that's the other thing is sometimes the loopy solution is better even in APL because it doesn't take as many computations. Anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, so we've looked at basically three different approaches, two and a half, in terms of thinking about the problem and a bunch of weird little nuances of APL and the different primitives and constructs that come out of this. So uh, if anyone has any questions about this stuff, uh, then go ahead and let us know now. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to summarize and then uh, I want to plug a couple of little things and then that'll be it for today. So um, data transformation slash the black box method. APL is about exploratory programming in a, in a l large sense. It's about just um, trying things out. It's interpreted. It's really convenient. It doesn't take that long to type quite involved things. So play with your data uh, and see if you can gain a new perspective. Of course, sometimes it's helpful to just stare at the two, <laughs> stare at your input and output and try and ask just, how do we just get from A to B? What is the mapping? And you never know. Um, if you're stumped, then have a go at a loopy solution. And then even if you think you've thought it through, you know, have it try a loop because apparently, you know, maybe something um, left a field, some revelation will occur, right? You know, who knows? I didn't know, didn't expect that. But there you are. Okay, I've had uh, nothing come through that. So to wrap up, um, while I'm on the topic of thinking in APL, just wanted to kind of mention a thought I'd had because I don't know when I'll do another thing on this topic or whatever. Um, and this is just about speaking and listening. It's all right. It, it comes, it comes back and, and links to the, to the, what I've been talking about today, because, uh, in the documentation and all the official dialogue stuff, these functions have particular names, but I find that in practice talking to people and even doing APL myself, we tend to have these like colloquial, um, sort of ways of verbalizing the APL that I thought was quite interesting. So I kind of just wanted to show a little example of that. Um, I think Adam can paste this link if other people want to go back and watch it in a second. So hopefully the sound is all good. Um, you should be able to hear Aaron Sue. Uh, just say some APL. It's just very short. There's a layout. Two by oh, the two by, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the transpose of x that made that the table of the two equal plus first axis reduction to zero equals x outer product residue of x. <laughs> so, um, oh, sorry, I, I blocked the thing there. So I want to go to see, to see that one more time, just for, just because why not? So J, control shift I. Oh, that's not a good idea, but I imagine we've gone to that. Full screen, yeah. Ooh, one more, one more. Yeah, so not? that's the transpose of x catenate of the table of the two equal plus first axis reduction to zero equals x outer product residue of x. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Yeah, so there, um, you know, in particular, you got things like what, what does anyone call iota? Everyone calls it iota, it's the index generator, I guess. Um, but you know, weird things like that, and that that's end up leaking into other languages. So that was me really thinking about what does, what, what do people do when they think out loud in APL? And this is because, um, I want to mention, yeah, I kind of want to excuse myself of, uh, today's exploration because obviously I've planned this and it's premeditated and so maybe some of the steps, and certainly it took me a minute to wrap my head around some of the bits in terms of re trying to reason about them, you know, reason about them in my head and reason about them in natural language so I could explain them to you. Um, but there's also this question that comes up in, especially the papers that I referenced in the first webinar, asking, you know, what is thinking in APL and is there any way to capture and analyze that process? for, I'm not sure how long now, and it hasn't been every week, 
Um, I've been solving problems sort of in real time on YouTube just to try and put something out there where it's someone going through the thought process and the dead ends and stuff. I've also tried to edit out, edit out the boring bits, so hopefully they're not too long. But if you're interested in seeing that, um, then you can search uh, Rickety P Pearl Weekly Challenge, that's R-I-K-E-D-Y-P, or there's a, a link here, which I think Adam might have to paste in the chat as well. Um, it's a bit of a shameless plug, but it is kind of on topic. Uh, and if anyone else feels like doing something similar, then that would be amazing. You know, um, we want to see people doing APL in out in the wild. So that'd be great. And if you do that, you know, email us and let us know. So, yeah, I haven't had any uh, things through, so I'll assume that everything uh, was sort of clear and hunky-dory, or I'll go to the chat in a minute and find out if it's a complete mess. We'll see. But that is it for me for today. Next week, uh, the British APL Association is having another open session. They've been going for the last couple of weeks, last few, last couple of months, and they've been really, uh, really good, really enjoyable. Um, we just sort of hang out and chat about general APL stuff. So that's next Thursday, same time. Then the week after that is the next dialogue webinar, which will be a follow up to the rank operator stuff. Um, and this is focusing on rank and dyadic transpose. So if you want to master some of the two of the pretty, pretty advanced primitives, I don't know how much to oversell that. Let's leave it alone. Um, that's happening in two weeks. Ray cannot will be showing SVG next week. Sorry, I just had a comment through. Uh, Ray Cannon will be showing SVGs in APL next week. Ah, uh, something vector graphics, um, which are a really good way of putting images on in general. And then also uh, most web browsers, basically all the web browsers most people use, um, render them. So it's, you know, good for doing that. Uh, I think D3JS, that library handles SVGs. So basically, um, yeah, that'll be really interesting, actually. So image manipulation, very cross-platform, very open. Um, how to handle those with APL, I suppose. Ray Cannon, look forward to that. That's next week, British APL Association webinar. Thanks. Thanks, Ray and Adam, for letting us know. Then... Uh, Coming up, November, Dialogue 20 Online, the user meeting this year, for reasons everyone knows, is going to be on Zoom, uh, and you can register on the Dialogue website. There's a link here. It's not that hard to find. You can search Dialogue 20 Online. I think that'll get you there too. Um, yeah, and details on there as well, and the program and stuff. Excellent. Oh, uh, that'd be it. Alrighty. Yep. Thank you very much again for listening and watching and whatnot. Uh, see you next week if you're at BAA or in two weeks here. Okay. Bye.